serve a pretty good God. Amen? Amen. Guys, I want you to take a minute or two. Well, not even that long. Take it a second or two. Just to greet one another. We're going to play through the chorus of how great thou art. And hey, here's the clue. When it's done, go back to your seat. All right? Got it? Everybody nod. Got it. Okay, thank you. Morning. Am I on? I'm on. Woohoo! All right. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, so glad to see all y'all's shiny faces this morning. A um, few announcements. Uh, Miss Laura's not here, so I'm going to take care of Vacation Bible School. Joy, you want to tell them about uh, camp this week? This week is our youth camp, and so it's going to run from Tuesday through uh, Friday. And on Tuesday, we're going to be here. Um, Wednesday, we're going to start here, and then we're going to head on over to the Yurix house. And then on Thursday, uh, we will be here again. We're going to start here and then go over to the Bartons. And then on Friday, we're going to do, we're going to go on out to the beach for the day. Um, this week, I want you to pray for our students because we are going to be going through a series by Francis Chan called Finding Truth. And as you all know, um, truth has definitely uh, been something that uh, our culture really struggles with. And so we're hoping this week um, through uh, the teaching and then through small groups and then just having some fun that we can help to instill our children with the fact that the Bible is truth no. and that Jesus is truth 
and that they can be prepared for when they move on out into this next school year. We have um, quite a few who are going to be moving into high school this next year. And so they need to be well equipped and well prepared. Um, and so I ask for you all as a church, pray over the, our youth this week. Um, it is $25 for each of them um, to attend, just going to be able to cover our, their food this week. But pray over them. Pray that God does a work in their life. Uh, pray that uh, throughout this next year, don't stop praying at the end of this week. Continue to pray that God would work through them. We have a mixture of homeschoolers as well as those who are in the public school system. They all need the truth of who God is instilled Amen. into their lives. And so please keep that as the, at the forefront of your prayers for our youth. Thank you. Just a prayer point that occurred to me uh, just then as she was speaking regarding our youth. Continue your prayers. I remember Pastor had challenged us to pray at 8 o'clock every night uh, for our church. Uh, and this has been over a year ago because it was when COVID started. To pray for our church, to pray for COVID, and, you know, just everything in general that surrounds all of that. One of the prayer uh, points that just occurred to me is praying for our pastor search team. So, you know, we're still looking for an associate youth pastor. Just continue to pray about that. Um, all right, Miss Laura is not here today, so I'm going to go through all of her announcements. Uh, VBS is coming. It is the 8th, I'm sorry, the 9th through the 13th of next month. There are a few more spots to fill. Uh, if you want to look out at the uh, sign-up sheet out here in the foyer, any questions you have regarding the responsibilities, just give Laura a call, okay? Um, and there's always plenty of people around to help with this, this sort of thing. Uh, let's see. Uh, tent and decoration day. You know, every year we have the tent out here. It's a great blessing because it uh, comes through a church in... Um, oh, Wendell's not here. Okay, I was going to ask him where it was. But uh, it comes through a church out of the, the Rosenberg area, actually. And it takes... 15 to 20 men to help set this thing up. So if, if we need some men here on the 7th to help set up the tent. And also the ladies, the teachers, the helpers, and anybody else who's led to come and help, we need them here to help decorate for, v for VBS. Okay? Uh, let's see. I'm trying to make sure I get everything. VBS tent takedown day is the next Saturday, which is the 14th. We don't need as many men, but... Guys, if you enjoy putting the tent up, you'll really enjoy taking it down because it's a lot easier. It just kind of comes down. You've got to guide it. Anyway, but and then again on that day, anything that's not cleaned up after VBS, we need uh, the ladies and men to, to come in and help us get it all ready for Sunday morning service. Uh, let's see, VBS, uh, speaking of VBS and student day camp, the week of student day camp, which uh, the 28th, that Wednesday, there will be no activities here at the church. Also, Vacation Bible School week on the 11th, Wednesday the 11th, there will be no activities here at the church for the evening. Let's see, what else? Uh, men's quarterly breakfast is coming up on uh, the, the last Saturday of this month. There's a sign-up sheet out here if you have any questions or would like to help. See Jerry, okay? But let us know if you're going to be there so he has an idea of how much to cook. And then last but not least is a biggie here for us. On the Sunday, August 29th is our annual meeting. Uh, we do have quarterly meetings, but this is our annual meeting where we come together and we elect our new church officers uh, and any of the church big business like that. You know, we, we have our new admin teams and everything come together. So I um, would like you to please, please be in prayer for this important meeting. The July newsletter had the information that you need in it, and the August newsletter will also have the information that you need in it regarding prayer for these, these things. Um, there was one more thing here. Oh, yes. Uh, also, and this kind of goes along with, but it doesn't have to wait. We're looking. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet out here for those uh, who would like to be teachers for uh, the Sunday school classes. Please... Uh, be sure and take a look at that. And again, if you have any questions regarding that, see Jerry. He's our Sunday school director, and he can help you with anything that you might need for that. And I think that's about it. Thank you. We have one more really important 
announcement this morning. So, and it, this isn't the part that's the, well, this is important as well. So we have two. So Pastor Jackson is not with us this morning. He is over in Florida. Um, um, I guess he had to hijack the kids <clears throat> and get them out of Florida. Yeah. So uh, somebody had taken them to Florida and left them there. Not, not wondering, not saying who did that, but somebody did that. And then um, she came back leisurely on a, on an airplane. <clears throat> but Pastor Jackson, let's pray for Pastor Jackson and all four of the kids this morning. As they're, they are traveling back from Florida. Uh, they're driving today, right? They're listening to us as we're broadcasting, I think. So don't anybody say anything bad about, about the pastor. But uh, yeah, we're we're aren't, aren't you happy that you have a pastor that has a family and that he loves his kids and he dedicates himself to not just the fellowship of Hill Store but to the fellowship of his family as well. That's an awesome thing. So praying for safety and for a great trip together. It, it might even be fun. You never know. <laughs> I've never had a fun trip with my kids, but it could happen. <laughs> So the second great thing today is Pastor Kenley is with us this morning. He is uh, going to be speaking today. So Kenley, would you raise your hand back there, everybody see where you are. There he is. He's got his wife and his family. He's got uh, three kids with him as well. So uh, just pray God's blessing on him as he comes to, to speak for us today and for us as we hear and as the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts. Gentlemen, at this time, would you come forward and let's receive our morning offering. That'll work. Look at that. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this day, God. I pray that as we as we worship together, God, we will realize, God, that, that there's there's more to this life than just coming here once a week or twice a week and spending time with each other. The point of it is to leave this place and to carry your message with us as we go. God, as we pool our resources together, as, as we spend our time together, as we study your word together, God, may your name be glorified in all these things that are done. Today, as we, as we receive an offering, Father, may we each give in accordance to the way that you have blessed us, Father. Thank you so much. Every good and perfect gift is from your hand. We thank you so much for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Sing together. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. Sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. Storm 
done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain.
Brother Kenley, would you come please and lead us to God's Word and what He has to say for us today as He's coming. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for Your loving kindness. Thank You for an everlasting love. Thank You that from the foundation of the world You had this plan that You would come and pay with Your own blood the penalty for our sin. That You would substitute Your perfection for our filth. And that when we confess with our mouth, Jesus, that You are Lord, and believe in our hearts, God, that You raised Him from the dead, that great exchange takes place. And we become a part of Your family. Whether we were born into that family by culture as being a Jewish person, or whether we are adopted as most of us probably are as Gentiles. God, we thank You that You included us and we can be a part, that can be heirs, that we can be joint heirs with Jesus Christ. God, we lift up Ken Lay this morning as he preaches. God, may Your name be glorified. Would You fill his heart? Would You fill his mind? Would You just be in his mouth and speak directly to us? Holy Spirit, communicate the truth that we need to hear today. And may your name be glorified in all these things, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Mike, can you hear me? Good? All right. Praise the Lord. Would you um, just give God a uh, clap of him so that Amen. you worship him? Amen. I'm so excited to be here. Um, Pastor Jackson. And Joy, thank you for inviting me here to um, share the word. Uh, I met uh, I met them a few, couple of years ago, and one of the things that drew me to them was their heart. They have a heart for people, and um, it was um, I think my son was my wife is there with our kids, Elliot and Aaron. Raise your hand so they can see. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so it, it, it was through my wife, actually, to a, at a homeschool uh, meeting. And the way Joy just did everything, she did it so seamlessly. I told my wife, I said, yeah, put them there. They're going to that homeschool. <laughs> when I first met them, it was really, really good. And Joy, thank you again for your friendship. And um, Pastor Jackson, I know you're watching. Um, thank you for inviting me to preach and to teach at your church. When it's time to teach and minister, it's always a joy and a privilege, but it's also a kind of a concern because when you're sharing God's Word, you want to make sure that you correctly apply God's Word because Amen. the Bible tells us that those who share God's Word will be judged harshly. So I can't come up here and come blow smoke. No, God is going to deal with me if I do that. So um, this morning, um, I've changed the title so many times. You know, I was like, I told Pastor Jackson something, and then at this morning I told April, I said, okay, we just leave it as lessons learned from Ephesians, right? Walking. So um, we'll be talking about the book of Ephesians because I think it's a wonderful book to um, study. It's, um, some people have called Ephesians the queen of the epistles to Paul. If you can't hear me very well, it's because of my accent, so I'm sorry about that. You can strain a little bit, then you can understand what I'm saying, okay? Um, so we're talking about Ephesians and lessons learned from Ephesians. The first part of, um, of the sermon will be talking about, you know, um, the background of Ephesus. Ephesus, how the church started, and the purpose of the letter to the, um, to the Ephesians. The second part, I'm going to zero in on basically um, Ephesians 5, 1 to 21, about our walk and how we should walk in this world. The world is a complex place filled with different people, different stuff. You guys, you don't even need to put on the news, you know. We don't even listen to news anymore because, you know, it's always bad, 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 bad every time. But we can't go in a hole and hide in a hole somewhere. We have to be able to live in the world, and we have to be able to 
um, walk as Christ wants us to walk. So um, the message I put on my heart when uh, Pastor Jackson asked me to come and share is about uh, is to talk about Ephesians. You can learn a lot from the book of Ephesians. So um, since we'll be talking about walking a lot, the first thing I wanted to talk about was I remember growing up in Nigeria. Let me set my alarm here so that I don't do I don't go over the limit. Okay. Let's start. All right. When I was growing up in Nigeria, I'm originally from Nigeria. When I grew up in Nigeria, I remember somebody who told me that if he won a billion dollars, actually no, not a billion dollars. If he won a million dollars, he will go on the street and start slapping everybody because of his newfound status. And to me, I was like, really? What would make you go down the street and start slapping people? He said, well, because now I have wealth. Now I can do anything I want. And that stuck with me for a while. What would you do if you got a billion dollars? Would you tell your neighbor, I'll slap you, but I'll give you $10 million? What would you do? When we go to the book, this book of Ephesians, it tells us about who we are. It tells us a lot of things. And basically, we've been given billions and billions of riches and dollars in Christ. So instead of me going down the street, slapping people up and down, God wants us to know we have billions in him, and God wants us to be able to walk with that knowledge. Are you guys understanding what I'm saying? So what would you do with the billions that you have? Now, the billions now is in Christ. How would you walk? That would be the main part of what I'm going to be talking about today, about our walk in this world. Because God wants us to know that we are heirs to him, and we are his children, but he desires a specific kind of walk that he wants from us while we are on this earth. Not going down the street slapping people, but walking according to what he's called us to walk. So, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, let's go to, let me, let's talk a little bit about Cities. Right now we have the um, Olympic Games in where? Tokyo. Uh, cities have always played critical roles in the history of the church. If I talk about Jerusalem, you know that's where Christ died for our sins. If we talk about Rome, it's known as city of law and justice, you know, a long time ago. New York, city of what? Trade and what? Commerce. In the New Testament, Ephesus was that kind of city. So I want to take you a little bit back into the mind of Apostle Paul when he wrote this letter to the Ephesians. And we're going to go there a little bit, and then we'll come back to the main um, message, which is about walking. The church in Ephesus was a very significant church in the first century. It was where Paul had its base of operations. The other six churches in the book of Revelation were planted by the Ephesian church. Did you know that? The Ephesian church planted the other six churches in the book of Revelation. They had a very good pastoral team in Ephesus, in the Ephesian church. They taught sound doctrine in the Ephesian church. Paul founded the church, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Timothy pastored in that church, and later on, towards the end, the Apostle John also pastored that church. And when Pastor Jackson was asking me to talk about, you know, I was like, you know what? I was, I was praying, I felt the Lord say, let's talk about the Ephesian church, because there's a lot of things we can learn from the Ephesian church. A lot of good things, then also some bad things, which we will talk about. 
many of the epistles in the New Testament, they were written to or about Ephesus or about the Christians in Ephesus. Of course, Ephesians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, also part of the book of Revelation. About seven books which speaks to his influence in the first century. So it's a very, very good book to study. A little bit about the background of Ephesus. Ephesus, the name Ephesus means desirable. It, it derives its greatness from two main things. Commercial trade and religion. Just like we talk about New York. But the religion there was basically idol worship. Ephesus, during this time, is now located in the modern-day Turkey. At that time, it had a population of about 250,000 people, which was a lot in those days. They worshipped so many pagan deities. They had about, all, about 14 different pagan temples. Can you imagine in a place where everywhere you go, pagan, 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 all kinds of stuff. But there was one that no one rivaled. It was the temple of Artemis in Greece or Diana in Latin. And you see this in the, in the book of Acts when Paul was dealing with, when Paul was there. That temple was about the size of a football field and a half in length. The worship of idols prevailed in almost every aspect of the life of the Ephesians. And it was very essential to the city, as you read in Acts chapter 2. I asked Pastor Jackson where you guys were, and he said you guys were in Acts, um, sorry, in Acts 20. He said you guys were in Acts 20 in your um, sermon. And you see that. To be able to trade in the town market, the town market was called Agora. Okay, and to be able to trade there, there was an incense burner before you go into the town market. And as an act of loyalty to the emperor, you are required to take an incense, okay, and take that incense and drop it in the incense burner as an act of loyalty to the emperor. Basically, what you were saying, when you drop that thing, you're saying Caesar is God. Can you imagine that? Christians struggled with that, and they were shut out from the city life. It's almost like going to buy something with a credit card, and they tell you, before you put your credit card in, you have to put an incense in the incense burner and say, you know, some pagan is God. That was the environment the Ephesian church were living in that time. There was also worship in the temple. And the worship in, in, in the temple was comprised of burning incense again. They will burn their incense. Then they will play a flute. And people will reach a very emotional frenzy. Then they will perform all kinds of sexual orgies. Not only that, and they'll do this from like morning to the evening. I remember one time when I was in Denmark, when, you know, I was just in my hotel room, I had like a, um, a, a procession, and it was some people, the Hare Krishna people, you know, moving, you know, doing their thing. But in, during this time, it was every time. You go to this corner, that corner, that was what you find. Day and night. They will cut themselves and sometimes cut part of their sexual organs in praise to that, to Diana. So everyone, including Christians, were required to do, uh, were required to proclaim that Caesar is God, but then all this stuff was going on in the city. I'm trying to give you a background of Ephesus at that time. And you would think that this Diana or this Artemis was some beautiful goddess or something. No, she was not. 
<laughs> she was not. To the contrary, the Diana of Ephesus or Artemis, you know, was a short, very short, squat, repulsive looking character covered with many breasts, which symbolized um, fertility. And they also believed that she fell from the sky and that God sent her down. Can you imagine living in that environment and trying to do church in that environment? That was what, that was the background. Not only were Christians hounded, the priests in the temples everywhere were always hawking their statues. It was a difficult place to preach the gospel. Can you imagine going to the bank one day to get money and as the clerk or the teller is opening her drawer or cupboard, statues of um, Artemis and all that falling down or saying, hey, this is my new statue, blah, blah, you know, what will you do? Finally, there was another pressing issue in the city. The city was filled with a lot of demonic activity and activity of demons. You see that in Paul addressed some of them. It was they would do oracles, they do miracles, wonders, and the you know the worshippers would go into a frenzy. This was one of the reasons why Paul had to write Ephesians chapter six, trying to help them to know how to deal with demonic activity. Hopefully, this gives you an idea of the background of Ephesus. How did the church start? The Ephesian church was started um, about 15 to 20 years after Jesus died. In Acts 18, 18 to 21, during Paul's second missionary journey, Paul came to Ephesus and preached. But there were zero conversions. Sometimes when you go preach the gospel and there are no conversions, don't lose hope. Because you're planting seeds there. And maybe somebody else are water it. But at that time, there was no conversions. In Acts 18, 24 to 28, there was a Jew who was called Apollos, who was from Alexandria. He was very eloquent, was mighty in scriptures, but his knowledge was very limited. So what happened was Priscilla and Aquila took him under their wings to teach him more correctly the things of the Spirit and the things that was happening after Pentecost. In Acts 19, 1 to 7, Paul made his second visit to Ephesus and spoke to 12 disciples of Alexander. I mean, sorry, I said Alexander, Apollos. What he found out there, if you read Acts 19, 1 to 7, let's quickly go there to, um, and read. Because I want to mention something important there. Acts 19, 1 to 7. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul had passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much heard about the Holy, there's the Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve. So there were twelve disciples there of um, Apollos. I remember Apollos, I don't have time to go, I'm looking at my clock ticking to um, um, go into that, but what was important was that they were this, 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 these guys were taught the baptism of John. What is the baptism of John? Up until Pentecost, that was the required thing. And what was that? The baptism of John is what? To repent and to be baptized 
in preparation for the kingdom that was coming. So John was telling them, there's a kingdom coming. You have to repent and you have to be baptized with water. And up until Pentecost, that was valid. So the knowledge was limited. Okay? But what Paul um, taught them was that that kingdom that you said is coming is already here. It happened in Pentecost. Okay? The kingdom has come, but it's come with power. Those who repent will, will be baptized. Their sins will be forgiven. And then one big issue, which was very important for a Jew, was that you will receive the Holy Spirit. In Joel 2, the Bible tells us that Joel was prophesying, seeing afar, talking about what will happen, I mean, the promise of the Spirit. As a Jew then, if you remember, in the book of Judges and in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit will come upon and then leave. Upon and leave. And, upon and leave. So, they knew that when the Messiah comes, they will be indwelt by the Spirit. And they wanted that. So these guys didn't really understand that. In Acts 2, when Peter was preaching, Acts 2, 38 to 39, let's go there quickly. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But the promise is to you and your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord God will call. So Paul came in and taught these 12 disciples who didn't really know much. They were still waiting for the kingdom to come. The kingdom was already here. Christ has ascended, the Holy Spirit was in us. And Paul taught them the correct doctrine, the correct theology. And they received the Spirit. They became baptized in the Spirit. They received the indwelling of the Spirit. And that's how the church in Ephesus started. In Acts 19.19, in Acts 19, verse 19, the Christians started to meet in the school of Tyrannus. It's most likely a Gentile place of learning and philosophy. If you look at Acts 17, 16 to 34, Acts 18, 6 um, to 8. Paul met with Christians there every day, teaching them from the scriptures about Jesus and the gospel, which was his normal custom. He taught this way in the school of Tyrannus for two years in Acts 19.10. You see the reference there. But according to Acts 20.31, he spent three years teaching and training the Christians in Ephesus. They must have met at some, in some other location for some time, both before and after they met in the school of Tyrannus in Acts 18.19-20. And if Paul was teaching three years, I can bet you that it's likely that he didn't just teach 30 to 40 minutes sermon. You know that in Acts 20, right? Because you guys have been going through that. So, if most likely Paul taught night and day. So let's just assume that Paul taught four hours a day, which I think it's actually more than that. So if he taught four hours a day, and he did this for three years. This comes down to 4,380 hours of teaching that Paul presented, provided to the Ephesian church. Again, 4,380 hours. If the average Christian listens to one sermon each week of, let's say, 40 minutes, it would take that average Christian 126 years to receive the same amount of teaching that Paul gave the Ephesian church. Can you imagine that? It would take the average Christian 126 years to receive the training the Ephesians got. So they got a lot of training from Paul. A lot of people today are looking for a fast track to spirituality. You know what that fast track is? Spend as much time in the Word of God. The more time you spend in the Word of God, the quicker you mature as a disciple of Christ. It's no wonder this church was one of the strongest in the New Testament. In just three years, they grew into what would take 126 years for the normal Christian church. So, what's the purpose of this letter to the Ephesians? 
there was influence of pagan society, like I, we talked about. Paul had to talk about that in Ephesians 6. Persecution of, of, of the church, false teaching, syncretism. What is syncretism? Syncretism is when you mix religion. So in those days, it's easier for them to add Christ. You know, it's like Jesus and something. Christ and something. Like we see today. Instead of just Jesus alone. There was some little dis- division in the church between Jews and Gentiles. Ephesian was basically a Gentile church. But there were a lot of Jews scattered there who were living there. In Galatians, it was the opposite. Paul was telling the Jews to accept the Gentiles. Here, it's the opposite. He was telling the Gentiles to be able to, I mean, to accept the Jews and to, um, to be able to have no division there. So the culture clash there was not about skin color, but it was about background. So, having said all that, a brief review of Ephesians. Why is this letter so important? Why is the I mean, letter so great? Like so many of Paul's letters, the first three parts, there are six chapters. The first three parts is doctrinal. Ephesians 1 through, um, I mean, 1 to 3. It's, it's doctrinal. The, 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 the last, the second part, Ephesians 4 to 6, is more practical. Doctrinal is concerned mainly about the great facts of redemption which God has done for us. It tells us about who we are. If you're struggling about who you are and what your church is, read Ephesians. It tells you exactly about who you are, what you are, and what God did a long time ago for us. So who are we? We are chosen by God. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's what the first part is telling us. But you will not understand it if you don't understand how to sit, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So the first part tells us about who we are, what we have in Christ. What do we have in Christ? We have eternal security from our Father. If the Son sends you free, you are free indeed. No one can take you away from him. Two, we have salvation from the Son. We have sealing from the Spirit and power through Christ. These are all the riches that we have. Wealth beyond we can imagine in Christ. The practical side is in Ephesians 4 to 6. It tells us about the demands in terms of Christian conduct and zeal. And zeal. That God is making upon us in the light of redemption. So now you know that you have this in Christ. How should you walk? How should you walk? You know that you have this foundation. How do you walk? So the second part is what we're going to be focused on today. And the second part is divided into two parts, like I said. Ephesians 4 from verse 1 to Ephesians 6, 9. It's about our walk. It's about how we walk. God, he calls us in Ephesians 4 1 to be um, to walk worthy of the calling in which He's called us. And it goes into so many other things, but it's about our walk. It's about our relationship. The other uh, from Ephesians 6 10 to Ephesians 6 24, it's about our stand. With, with conflict with the enemy. So basically, if you want to look at it, the first one, chapter 1 to 3, is about what we receive from Christ and who we are. Then Ephesians 4 to 6 is about what to do with our responsibility and how to walk. So in a way, the way I kind of put it down is some keywords. Ephesians 2 to 6 tells us about our position in Christ. We see that with Christ in what? Heavenly places. So we see. We see that with Him. We're not seated by ourselves. We see. We see that because Christ Himself is already seated at the right hand of the Father. So because He's seated at the right hand of the Father, we're seated with Him before the foundation of the world. 
And then um, Ephesians 4, 1 talks about, um, tells us about our walk. And then from Ephesians 6, 10 to the end, tells us about our stand. So you're seated because you know you are seated, then you can walk. And while you're walking, then you can stand. So that's basically a review of it. We're not supposed to be living in holes and under rocks, scared and ashamed of who we are, but we're hers to be strong. We're spiritual billionaires. We're children of God. Because of this, we can walk in this world boldly and proclaim that Jesus is Lord. So when we say sitting, what does sitting mean? In Ephesians 1, 17 to 21, it says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of our glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in knowledge of him. As it goes on and on and tells us that in verse 19, and in verse 20, which he walked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. Because Christ is seated, then we can sit. The other is you sit first. Why? Because Christ is seated. You cannot walk before you sit. You have to sit, then you can walk, and then you stand. Sitting is an attitude of rest. I can sit in Christ because Christ has already finished the job. Walk stops when we sit down. We can only advance in our Christian life when we first learn how to sit. If you don't know how to sit, and then you're walking and standing before you learn how to sit, you're doing it the wrong way. You're going to grow weary. When we walk or stand, we bear on our legs the weight of our own body. You see that right now, you're not doing anything. You're trusting in the weight of that chair that is holding you. That's what God wants us to do. He's already finished the walk. He's done everything. He wants us to sit. How do we sit? We trust in his work. We don't struggle. We don't try to do our own thing. We just accept and believe what he said, and we sit. Our Christian experience does not begin with walking, but by sitting. When we try to reverse the order, it results in disaster. Maybe you're here today and you've been walking instead of sitting. There's grace for you to go back and sit before you walk. Sometimes when you walk before you sit, it's like having a 3-volt battery trying to power this church. Can a 3-volt battery power this church? No. If you're not seated with him and rested in him, you can't walk. W-A-L-K. You don't have the en enough power. I was talking to uh, somebody who came for prayer one time, and she was doing every single thing. You know? And I asked her, I said, are you seated with Christ? She said, yes. Have you given this issue to him? I'm not sure. She was basically doing everything. And then she came weary and really, really tired. And I said, when you don't sit, you're basically taking the place of Jesus. You can't take the place of Jesus. Only he can take the whole weight of the world. If you're running a church or a school or whatever, if you're not seated, you are going to be overwhelmed. Perhaps maybe your work, you've been, you haven't sat down. You need to sit down before you can walk. Walk. What does walk mean? The, 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 the word there in Greek is walk around. When you walk around, you're walking towards something. Sorry. Let's kill that. Yeah. When you're walking around, <laughs> sorry. You're walking towards something. Basically, as heavenly people, Paul challenges us in our relationship to what? Both domestic, public, to bring that heavenliness, that seatedness that we're with him 
into our walk with him. I mean, into our walk in this world. So, do you as a heavenly person bring heavenliness in your relationship? Or do people see you and run away? Oh, he's coming. Run. Oh, she's coming. (laughs) Run. Or do you bring heavenliness and people want to come towards you? The main point of walking is that we sit forever with Christ so that we may walk continuously before men. Stand. Uh, Our Christian experience begins with sitting, leads us to walking, but does not end there. Every Christian must learn how to stand. We have so much stuff going on in in our nation with all kinds of stuff they are trying to force on us and all that. We have to push back. We have to stand. But we stand based on what Christ has done, not you trying to go and do anything. If you don't know how to sit and walk, you can't stand. Because if you go the reverse way, you're going to be doing it in your own strength. So we sit, we walk, Then we stand. So, looking at my time now, let's go to the main part, which is walking. That's what I want to talk about talk about today. Quickly, Ephesians five, verse one. Therefore, be imitators of God as their children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. So Paul started from verse chapter 4, talking about this walk that we talked about. Ephesians 1 through 3, he's talked to, talk, told us about how to sit, where we see that, what we have in, in Christ. Now he begins to tell us how to walk. In 4, 1, talked about how to walk worthy of the calling which is called us, and so many other things. But I want to jump, start from 5. Because there are three bases, that, 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 there are three walks there that I want to emphasize this morning. There are so many others, but there are three that I want to emphasize. So it starts there, be imitators of God as their children. What does it mean to be an imitator? It's to copy something. And it says, walk in love. The therefore that you see there is there because it's talking about in light of everything you've heard, you know how to sit. We talked a little bit about walking in, in Ephesians 4. Now, in light of that, I want you to imitate God. Copy God as his child. And how do we copy him? The first one is by walking in love. It's walking in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice, a good smelling aroma. So it's telling us we cannot walk if Christ has not already done that. Because God is love. So he's telling us to imitate him. And one of the main areas there is in love. Now, walk in love. Then now he now goes and talks about things that you need to, that is not in love. Chapter uh, Verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not even be named among you as is fitting for, for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no man deceive you with empty words. For because of this, the wrath of God comes upon the children, upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers of them. The first thing that I want to highlight here is walking in love. When I came in this morning, your church was so, all the people were just so loving. They welcomed us. They told us, you know, it was like, it was so wonderful to see that. But God is telling us here, we need to walk in love. And I have to confess that sometimes it's difficult it's easier for me sometimes to say, God, I love you, than to love my brother. And First John tells us, if you say 
you don't love your brother, then you don't love God. It's easier for me a lot of times to just, I want to focus on God and love God and all that. But then I see my brother, I don't love him. And if you, as we go forward, you will see this is one of the issues that Christ had against the Ephesian church in Revelation chapter 2. What for love there is agape, and there are four types of love. Storge, eros, phileos, agape. He's talking about agape here. It's the love where you don't get anything back. Where you're right, where you don't have any right. Paul was trying to tell the Ephesian church, yes, you live in this pagan city. Yes, you see all the demonic activity around. Yes, you see all of that. But you have to walk in like you don't have any right. And come with the heavenliness of God in this city. I believe that's what God is trying to tell us here. All the other things that you see around from all the Gentiles, all the fornication, all that, don't let it be lame among you. Walk in love. Two. From verse 8. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. Second thing is to walk in the light. What does it mean to walk in the light? For this fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. That word there, finding out is everything you do, you're always looking. Is this God's will or is this not God's will? You want to go to the market. Is it God's will for me to go to the market right now or to the grocery store now? I want to do this. Is it God's will? That's what Paul is telling you there because you're always going to be in dynamic situations and you need to ask God even the littlest things. Is it God's will for me to do? 11. Have no fellowship with any of who walked of darkness, but rather expose them. It's very explicit. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. I asked my son one time, What does it mean to see? And he couldn't really answer the question. We see when light falls on an object. When there's no light, you can't see. So we need God's light to help us to see. The Ephesian church, back to... Um, one about love. They had doctrine. They were not soft towards doctrine. They had Paul. They had Timothy. They had John. They were guarding doctrine. And I love doctrine. The church has to have doctrine. But sometimes it's very difficult for a guard dog to smile. Have you ever seen a guard dog smile before? No. Yeah. So as much as we love doctrine, and I'm talking to myself, it needs to be mixed with love. Otherwise, you become religious. So your doctrine must be balanced with love. Because this was the situation with the Ephesian church. I personally believe that the Ephesian church were caught completely off guard by the charge in, in Revelation chapter 2. They were, pr they were really safeguarding doctrine, doctrine everywhere, which I love doctrine and I want doctrine. Without doctrine, we have nothing. But I believe that in their guard to protect the doctrine and be a guard dog and do all of that, they lost their first love as, we re uh, uh, as you see in Revelation chapter 2. And what did Jesus tell them? Three things. Repent, remember, and redo. Three hours. Repent, remember, and redo the first work. So what first works were they supposed to do? They had to go back and do the things that Paul did with them those three years that he lived and taught in Ephesus. They must meet on a daily basis to read God's word and study God's word and apply it in their lives. But sadly, history tells us that the Ephesian church did not heed the warnings of Paul 
or the warnings of John. Their light was indeed snuffed out. It appears they did not repent and return to the first work. They did not return to Jesus, their first love. As a result, they never regained their former glory. Today, the best and greatest church in the New Testament is no more. It has passed away. The region right now is entirely Muslim. I wonder what would have happened if Christ, in, if the church in Ephesus had repented and returned to God. But it's a lesson for us also. It's a lesson because the same things can happen to us. In fact, I would say it's happening to us right now. I would say the American church today is at the exact point in history that the Ephesian church was in Revelation chapter 2. The American church used to be one of the strongest in the world. Our nation was founded on biblical principles by godly leaders. There was a time in the late 18th century that the United States led the way in Western civilization, in Western civilization spiritual revival. There was a time in the 19th and 20th century when the strongest Christians and the most knowledgeable Christians in the world were from the U.S. There was a time in the, in the mid to late 20th, 20th century where the U.S. led the world in missionary endeavors, reaching unreached people groups in the world. But I'm afraid to say that like Ephesus, we've left our first love. God is at work now a lot in Asia and Africa. They are sending out more missionaries per day than the U.S. does in a year. They have more zeal, more love for God than most of us ever witnessed. And now our nation probably puts more puts more false prophets than good, healthy teachers. Our nation, our seminaries, our Bibles, colleges, our churches, our pulpits, and our pews are full of people who don't know the Bible and who don't know Jesus Christ. So we're at a crossroads. It's not too late to turn the tide. It's not too late to return to our first love. It's not too late to be in one nation under God. But if we do not repent, if we do not turn back to God, the day will come when most of us think that the U.S. will no longer be a Christian nation. It will, be, it will be a pagan nation. Or like Turkey, become an Islamic nation. We must hear the lessons from Ephesians. They were the greatest Christian church in Asia Minor. Now they are barely remembered. America used to be one of the greatest nations, Christian nations. God blessed us for that, but we are one generation away from extinction. If American Christianity continues on the path we're on, living our first love, Jesus Christ having abandoned the things that matter, such as Bible, prayer, then we too will be forgotten. We'll become a has-been. We'll become like France or like Germany. The Reformation took place in Germany. Now they are atheistic, humanistic, hedonistic, pagan. Or we'll become like Islamic like Turkey. That's what will happen to us if we don't repent and return to our first love. How do we hold this back? We can hold it back one person at a time, starting with ourselves. We can be like Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister in the Lord, in Ephesians. Let each one of us make sure that we can keep the U.S. from becoming like Turkey. Uh, we can't by our strength, but we can start with ourselves. We had a great church, but it's no longer there. We have a great church. You have a great church here. Where will it be in a year, five years, a decade from here? Where this church will be in five years, ten years, whatever years will depend on you. But we have to focus on our first love. It's 43 minutes, 32 seconds. I don't have time to go through. I kind of went over my time. I don't have time to go through the other things I want to say. I don't want Pastor Jackson to kick me off the stage. So I'm probably going to stop here because um, and I know the Lord wants, you know, he prepared this and he wanted me to share this. But the walking in love part is very, very important. And we don't want to become like those other nations. But it starts with us. And so, remember what he told them in Revelation chapter 2, which is, repent, remember, and redo the first work. I don't, you don't do things because you were, 
because you're just going through the motions. You do it because of the passion that you have for God and on your love for God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Father, we worship you. Father, we ask. We know without you, we can do nothing. So, Father, we ask that you would help us. We need your help. We need your grace. I, I need your help. I need your grace. Help me to walk in love. Help us to walk in love. Help us to walk in the light. And help us to walk circumspectively as wise people in this world doing your will. Help us to know how to seek. And help us to know how to walk and to stand. The lessons of the Ephesian church, a lot of lessons. We didn't get to all of them, but we went through, we, we got to love. Help us to be not just loving you, but to love you and to love our fellow brother and sister. You said that the greatest commandment is to love you with all our heart and all our mind and all our soul and also to love our neighbor as ourselves. So help us to love our neighbor. Even when it's easier to just only love you and not love our neighbor, help us to extend that love to our neighbor, whether in school, whether at work, whether at home, wherever, Lord. We ask that you fill us afresh with your spirit and help us. We need you. We need your help. Father, we thank you for what uh, we've heard this morning. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to walk worthily of the calling which you've called us. And that we'll do it by your spirit. And we will not end up having our life snuffed out. So let your name be exalted and be lifted up on high, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Kenley. <clears throat> would you mind standing at the front? And if anyone would like to come forward and just receive uh, uh, to pray, Kenley will be here. Joy, could I ask you to come up and stand for ladies and... Uh, Guys, let's, let's uh, lift up this song of worship and uh, as we are singing, uh, feel free to come to the front. Feel free to kneel and pray. Feel free to come to one of the, our brother or sister here, uh, either one, to pray. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise. That rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nation sing it louder. Cause nothing has the power to say But your name Jesus, in your name we pray Come Nothing has the power to save but your Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your 
name. Let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to save. But your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nation sing it louder. Cause nothing has the power to save But your name is a strong and mighty tower Your name is a shelter like no other Your name, let the nation sing it louder Cause nothing has the power to save But your name We have heard the name of God lifted up today. We have heard from His Word encouragement to sit at His feet, to walk with Him, and to stand firm. Thank you, Kenley, for bringing God's Word to us today. I appreciate you being here. Church family, would you like to express your gratitude in some form or fashion that we could understand. Amen. Thanks so much. Thanks for the family coming with you. Appreciate you guys fellowshipping with us today. Y'all take a minute and greet one another as we close out our service today. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for all that you've done in us. Thank you for the grace that you brought to us to allow us to have this relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yo.